<laughs> okay, let me make these quick announcements again. Uh, February the 16th will be Winter Jam. Uh, they will be eating at CC's Pizza and it costs $15 to get in a jam. The church will pay for the youth and they'll be leaving here at 1 o'clock. It's at Nashville. So uh, if you want to be a part of that, remember that. March the 23rd is the youth fundraiser. 5 p.m. Food and entertainment and silent auction. All this goes to the youth. And March the 30th and 2 to 4 is the Easter egg hunt. And then February the 5th, Mickey will be at Bite of Shade. Did you have a good time? Yeah. Okay. So we'll remember this. Continue to remember those that's, uh, I don't know if Greg got out of the hospital, did he? I don't know, April said this morning she thought he'd get out of the hospital. I haven't, I haven't heard of him, so let's remember Greg and Julia, uh, Kathy Perron, Miss Wanda. I believe Kathy goes back to St. Louis. 
us remember that. Yes. He's got pneumonia. Okay, let's remember Larry Lancaster. Any others? Nothing else. Uh, Joe Don Wilson, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father God, we come to you tonight, Lord, with humble, heavenly hearts. Lord, Lord, everybody on the earth, Father, if I would lift them up to you, Lord, Lord, I just pray, Lord, you'll deal with a broken body and a mind and a heart, Father. Father, your son comes to this earth, Lord, I deep in our hearts, we know, Lord, that he can heal anything. Broken back to a broken heart. Lord, Lord I just feel peace from every one of us people, Father. Father, all these out ministries we have, Father, I just pray, Lord, for them, Father, God, to heal ministries and sick. Lord, I don't want to let the elders disturb us, Father, God. Yes. I can go with some of these two thoughts, Lord, I just want to hear them up to you, Father. Father, tonight, Lord, we need to hear the message. I pray, Lord, you'll fill in full of spirit, Lord, and fill this house full of Full of smoke, Lord, and I can get in that from the eyes of the Father. I thought I was thankful for yeah. the miracles to be done here tonight, Father. Souls to be saved and, and lives to be changed, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you, Father, for sending the only Son to die on the cross to see his stripes, his wounds were all healed. And give us some precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
some of you, I wish we had like this, them football games, somebody with a camp. <laughs> this spotlight, and you put me up on film up here. There'd be some of you that you might cheer up a little bit. Because you ain't supposed to be that groupie in church. All right, I can only imagine.
they get a dose of something, and I mean, buddy, they come off the chain. Praise God. And I would see that, and my whole life I've thought, man, I'd like some of that. I'd like to get a dose of that. And there have been two or three times, people, been two or three times that I got a hold of something. Something got a hold of me. One time we was praying right here in a circle. The Lord laid it on my heart to uh, come up and mark my thing and uh, pray with Mark. And I come up and I, Mark was sitting there and I said, Mark, let's pray. And we walked up there and we just stood up and like this. And about that time, here come two or three others. Here come another guy, and we all just got on our shoulders, and we just praying. That's all we was doing was praying. But I'm telling you, something happened, and there was about two of us in that group just busted out laughing. I mean, the Spirit of God fell, and they just busted out laughing. And this other cat here, he come up. He wanted some too, or thought he did. I'll never forget this. Because I'm praying, but I'm looking at shoes. So I know who you are. And this cat walked up, and when he grabbed the hose, the spirit got on him, and he busted out laughing. All of a sudden, he turned left. He, he, it's too big a step for him. But, uh, you know, and I didn't get that. I just didn't get But I, I could just tell that what us men were doing was pleasing to the Lord. He was really pleased with us. And I mean, he got a hold of one or two there. And Greg was in on some of that. And, uh, hey, glory be to God. All right, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Then you're up, Mickey.
as I had the opportunity to preach uh, Miss Suzanne Flint's funeral this afternoon, Ronnie Stinson and I, uh, my mind went back uh, several years uh, over the conversations and the things that transpired in our lives and uh, some of the things that uh, I remember about uh, Suzanne and I call her Susie. But uh, as I was sitting there uh, pondering on a lot of things, uh, looking at the family, looking at Wayne and uh, Stephen, her son, and, uh, the two stepsons, I, I realized uh, how brief life really is. Susie was 55 years old. Uh, her life was cut short. And as I told, I mentioned that to Stephen, and it's her son. <coughs> Stephen said, you know, he said she wouldn't take care of herself. She just literally worked herself to death. Uh, she was at the barn uh, constantly all of her life. That's, she grew up in the barn. And, uh, so anyway, uh, pray for that family, uh, the Keiths, uh, Stephen, and all of those, and, uh, Wayne and Clint, uh, as they go on without her. Uh, Cars Marm will never be the same uh, without her, I'm sure. Uh, but as uh, we were singing that song, I thought about, you know, when Floyd was talking about uh, how sometimes you're in places and God does things that really get your attention. Uh, I remember Stephen and I, uh, he was about 10 years old, and I would pick Stephen up behind the restaurant at 3.30 in the morning, and we were heading for a duck hole somewhere, uh, and my grandsons were in the truck, and uh, usually Larry Lancaster was in the truck, uh, and one particular morning, I remember we were headed uh, for, I think it was Craven's Bay, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, in this same truck that I'm driving now today, and I remember the Holy Spirit fell in that truck as some of the grandkids and Stephen got to asking about salvation. And Larry and I got to explain to them what it meant to be saved. We, did, we had church in that truck all the way to the lake for 50 miles. And uh, what, a, what a glorious time uh, that was as I uh, shared the gospel with them and what it meant to be saved and how, uh, how it's important it was uh, to come to know Christ and uh, to give your life to Christ. And uh, I, I pray that uh, that has stuck with them and uh, they'll uh, always, always be reminded of that. Uh, not just the good times of duck hunting. We had a ball in duck hunting. But that, those conversations like that that we've had very, uh, very, very often uh, in doing that. And that was my whole purpose, really, uh, in carrying those boys, uh, was to teach them about Christ uh, through hunting. Uh, but anyway, uh, Floyd was talking about the fellow. And I remember in this passage I'm going to read tonight, uh, Solomon built the house of God. Uh, David couldn't build it. Uh, God wouldn't let him. Right. Because he had killed too many people. Right. He said, you've got bloody hands. I'm not going to let you build my house. But Solomon built the temple. And I, I remember, I love to read the passage where Solomon called the assembly of the church together. The congregation, all of Israel. And he spoke to them, read the words out of the book to them. And as he was reading the words out of the book, it said the glory of God fell upon that temple. Yeah. And it was filled with smoke. Yeah. 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 I can only imagine that happening in this place. When the glory of God was sent down on this place. Now I've seen some I've seen some services here uh, that, that I felt like the, the smoke was trying to get through the ceilings. Uh, I've run the aisle several times. And 
uh, you know, with the Spirit. I, we've had, I've danced in this right here uh, several times. Uh, the Spirit, when the Spirit gets a hold of you, listen, if you got what I got, you can't sit still. Amen. Uh, God begins to move inside of you. Uh, but but the sad thing is, uh, today, as I thought about this message, I knew uh, in my mind and in my heart what I wanted to preach tonight. And as I was preaching that funeral, I didn't preach very long, five or six minutes. I did the introductory. Uh, but as I was preaching, I was looking out over the crowd and Burns Funeral Home, it's a pretty large funeral home, and it was full. And as Ronnie Stinson put it, <laughs> he said, we're going to be preaching to a bunch of heathers today. <laughs> And I said, well, right now, I don't know about that. You might be right. I said, but uh, uh, we're going to preach to them nonetheless. Uh, but uh, as I looked over that crowd, my mind wandered, and I, I wondered how many out of that 150 or 200 people really, really knew the Lord like I did. And uh, I couldn't help but wonder, uh, you know, if they had ever heard uh, that Jesus saved. But they did today, nevertheless. Uh, but anyway, this, uh, and I, I thought about this, I thought about this message. I'm preaching tonight in the church, but on the edge. In the church, but on the edge. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. My, my uh, title on this particular passage is a warning against immorality. Uh, now, if you're a child of God, sometimes you commit spiritual immorality. Uh, we cheat on God, in other words. And here, uh, Solomon is, is giving instructions uh, and, and he, he, he says, my son, uh, and, and I think a father ought to give instruction to his sons uh, because the Bible tells me that if you'll instruct them in the ways of God, uh, they may depart from it, but they will return. They'll never forget it. So Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, now this may sound strange to you out of this text, but I, I'm trying to get somewhere with it. My son, attend unto my wisdom. And bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. <laughs> but her end is bitter as a wormwood, and sharp as a two-edged sword. I feel like I need to read that again, but I won't. <laughs> her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine, thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. Here's my text tonight. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. Lord, tonight, we realize where we'd be without you, God, tonight. Oh, God, there was times when this scripture pricked my heart, God. At times when I've been sitting in church, in the midst of church, sitting on the edge of evil, knowing that one step back the other way, I could go so easily. And yet you prompt me 
You, you've touched my heart, and you don't let me take that step backwards, back in to where I used to be. You keep me moving forward. God, help me tonight to look forward towards you, not look back where I came from, and depend and trust on you and you alone. God, we thank you for your word tonight. Let it speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Solomon is, is giving instruction and wisdom uh, to his son. Solomon, uh, uh, I don't know how much wisdom he could give or how much instruction he could give. He was the wisest man probably in the Bible. Uh, and yet, uh, he knew all about what he's talking about right here. About uh, what, what he was preaching here. About uh, the lips of a woman. Because you see, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he knew all about a woman that could drag you off even into the fifth, one foot in hell. Uh, and I'm not listen, women. I, I'm not. I'm not bashing y'all uh, because that works both ways. Uh, men have ruined many a home because of infidelity, and so has women. Uh, it's it's a matter of uh, what, which side you're going to stay on. And Solomon is giving the instructions here, and and he uh, he says, you know, uh, Solomon. Is well, well, Solomon is, is really um, uh, important because Solomon knew what it was to receive instruction, so he could give instruction. If you, if you stop and think about Solomon, who he was, uh, and you think about the instruction that he received, and how Solomon grew up in church, uh, he grew up watching his father David preach, he watched his father David sing and play the instruments in front of King Saul. He grew up in the house of God and in the king's palace is where he grew up. And he knew all about the ways of God because his father David uh, was on the edge many times in his life. In fact, uh, he, he went over the edge several times. Uh, so Solomon knew what it was like. And if you look at his lineage, look at his who he grew up with. Uh, with his father David uh, uh, as king and, and one who loved to worship God. And, and then if you look at David's father, uh, 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 Jesse, uh, Jesse, the Bible says, was a good man who had eight sons and he loved the Lord. And then if you look, Jesse's father, whose name was Obed, uh, Obed was a godly man, one that God says was just and upright. And so his daddy, his granddaddy, and his great-granddaddy, and then if you look one more further, you'll find uh, his great-grandfather, which was Boaz, uh, the husband of Ruth. Uh, so David came from a long line of men who loved God. No wonder. He received instruction and gave instruction because he had received instruction all of his life. Now, we receive instruction uh, most of our life from the time you're old enough to understand yes and no. I'm sitting there uh, at the funeral home this afternoon and Stephen's little boy, he's about uh, two years old. <coughs> And they're all, all the friends have done come by the casket. The family's now up in the casket. <coughs> and I'm watching this little boy. Me and Ronnie got tickled. This little boy had a bottle of water. Now you listen, in, in a funeral home, in a church, do not, do not give a two-year-old a bottle of water. <laughs> He's sitting there and he takes the cap off the bottle. And he puts it on his big toe on his shoe. And he's sitting there just like this, and he's got that bottle, and he'll take a drink, and he'll look around at me, and he's looking at that bottle cap. You know what he's fixing to do. He's fixing to punt that thing across the room. And I'm just waiting for that bottle cap to fly across the room, right in the middle of that thing. And, and, uh, and finally, somebody noticed what he was about to do, and went over and got the bottle cap off his shoe. 
Uh, that reminded me of myself when I was little. I, I would have probably done worse than that. Uh, but notice uh, little things like that. We, we're, uh, we're caught up in, in so many things in life. Uh, sometimes we forget what's really important in life. And, and so in this passage, uh, Solomon is simply giving instructions about uh, staying away uh, from enticing women is what he's talking about. Um, and, you know, uh, I know none of you men have ever experienced this. I hope you haven't. Uh, it, it, it's a dangerous thing. It really is. The Bible, he says in this passage, he says that we're supposed to, if you go on and read past where I stopped, it said drink from your own well and drink from your own sister. What's he saying? He's talking about staying at home and loving the wife of your youth, is what he goes on to say. And be faithful and be thankful for the woman that God has placed in your life. And, and th this whole passage is about that. And, but I noticed in verse 6, it, it said, her ways are movable. Uh, in other words, uh, a, a, a strange woman in your life is always moving herself and moving you. She's either moving you to a destruction or moving you away from destruction. She's moving. But the good news is uh, she may be movable, but we serve a God that does not move and does not change. He right. never does. Uh, and so this instruction, uh, as he's given it, uh, it causes us to understand. And it said, come not nigh to her house. I remember. I remember when I was in service. I was stationed in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And. I remember all the GIs. Uh, they. They couldn't wait to get a weekend leave. To go to the house of ill repute. Uh, Y'all know what I'm talking about. I, I'm serious. Uh, they, they were just fanatics about that. And I, you know, uh, anyway, uh, it says, come not nigh. Stay away from that door. Uh, uh, it's a dangerous thing, folks. It really is. Uh, because not only are you harming uh, yourself, uh, you're, you're harming your body. Uh, and God says to stay away. Anyway, I, I'm not going to try to dwell on that. Uh, but uh, it says he hated instruction. In, in, in verse 12. How many of you remember when you were growing up and in your home, your mom and daddy told you different things and you looked at them and you said, you just, I ain't doing that. And you just defied your mom and daddy. You didn't defy them very long if you lived my house. <laughs> but we tried, didn't we? Uh, yeah, we, we said, Mark, well, they don't, they're old fogies. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what's, I know what I'm doing. That's what I always said. But it got me in trouble every time. Uh, I'd end up uh, out somewhere with Joe Don at midnight or something. I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, but I hated instruction. I didn't even like high school. I didn't like school at all. Uh, because I didn't want to be instructed. I was too hard-headed. Uh, the work, it wasn't the workload, it wasn't the classes. I enjoyed the classes because I got to see everybody talk to everybody. But I didn't want to learn nothing. I was just there for a social club. That's all I was doing. Uh, and that, that's bad, folks. Now, you kids, now listen to this. Uh, you get in school and you get your books. You get you do what that teacher instructs you because down the road, uh, like in my life, I wished I had listened to those teachers. I needed that instruction, and I did not want to hear it. That's what he's saying here. Uh, he said, I hated instruction. But then in verse 14, uh, notice what it says. I was almost in all evil. Where? In the assembly and the congregation. Yeah. What was that? What does that mean? He was in the church house. Listen to me. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't care how many times you sing in the choir. I don't care how many times you say I love Jesus and sing praises to God. Listen to me. If you do not know Jesus, you're headed the wrong way, folks. You're headed for a place called hell. Amen. He said, I was almost. 
And, and I, I thought about that scripture, and I, and I thought about Jesus when, when he was here on, on the earth. He had his group of disciples that were following him, 12 of them. But there was a point in their life. Remember when they came to get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? And Peter stood by the fireside with the rest of the crowd and they asked him three times, are you with him? And he said, no, no, no. In fact, he cursed and said, no. He was on the edge. He was in the congregation. He knew where he belonged, but he was on the edge and he took a step off the edge. Yeah. I remember John. The Apostle John. When Jesus died on the cross, he had already rose from the grave. In fact, the same day, he said he's gone. He was on the edge. See, he was on the edge all the time and didn't even realize that he'd been going to church with Jesus for two and a half, three and a half years. But now Jesus has died and John said, I'm going fishing. It's over. I'm just going to go back to what I need, what I used to do. But the bad thing is, folks, listen to this. He took six of them with him. When he took that step off the edge. And it's the same with me and you. When you are on the edge, and listen, I, I, I say this all the time, it, I'm one step from being where I used to be every day. I can be tempted. I can, I, listen, temptation comes my way. And if I didn't have enough faith in God Almighty, if I didn't have my faith and trust put in Jesus Christ, I would be one step away from being an alcoholic again. I would. And so would you. It's that easy, folks. You, you say, well, no, I, I'd never do that. You just think you wouldn't. When temptation is knocking at your door, he said, don't even go near the door. Don't let it in. On the edge. He said, I was in the, on the edge of all evil. I was in the house of God. And I was sitting in the congregation. And yet I knew that if I didn't keep concentrated on the cross of Jesus, I could be swept over the edge. I read a story this afternoon. I didn't have much time, but I read a story. These engineers needed to move some precious cargo to the top of a mountain. And so they decided uh, that they, and the, the mountain road was one of those real little curvy roads with no guardrails. An old dirt road up the side of the mountain. Very, very treacherous. And they said, we need to hire some drivers to get this cargo up that mountain. So they started interviewing. They interviewed three guys. And the first guy, they asked him, have you ever drove on that road? Yeah, I've been up it lots of times. They said, how close can you get to the edge? And he said, well, I can get within 12 inches. And I'm, you know, I'm good. I, I can haul it. I said, okay. So the next guy comes in and they interview him and they ask him the same question. Have you ever drove on Oh, I drove this road all my life. He said, well, okay. How close can you get to the edge? He said, I can get within six inches of that edge and still not come unnerved. Well, okay. He may call you. So they interviewed the third guy. And they said, do you know this road? He said, I've been driving up this road since I was a teenager. He said, I know every foot of it all the way to the top of the mountain. And they asked him that same question. How close can you get to the edge? He looked at him. He said, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? You just said you drove up it all the time. He said, uh, how close do you get? He said, I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? He said, I never try to get close to the edge. I always stay where I know that I'm safe, where I know that my life is secure. I never get over there close enough to the edge where I'm worried about getting off. Folks, it's the same way with Jesus Christ. You can't get close to the edge every day of your life and expect God to move in your life. You've got to stay where you're safe and secure and not even look close over the edge because death. 
head is imminent over the edge. Yeah, you know, yeah, I remember those roads. So Solomon is giving this instruction to get uh, close to God, and, and, and he looks at that. Uh, see, uh, you take a tree, uh, and I, I look at tree when I'm hunting a lot. I look at a tree. Uh, matter of fact, I watched Joe Don packing trees across the field with a track hoe. And I watched him put them up. And I wanted to make sure he put them up straight when I watched him. Uh, and he did. But a tree, the way that it's leaning is usually the way it's going to fall. And it's the same way with your life. Whatever you're leaning towards is the way you're going to fall. If you're leaning toward evil like Solomon talked about, if you're right on the edge and you're leaning toward evil in your life, that's the way you're going to fall. In fact, when we lean that way, I believe Satan comes in with a silent chainsaw and begins to hack at us to get us to topple all the way over. That's his objective, is to get you where you think you'll never go. Satan works in our lives. Folks, believe it or not, he's there all the time. Uh, they, the, the things that happen in church that cause people to go over the edge. <laughs> uh, I, I've seen some crazy things happen in church that have caused people that were already on the edge to just drop clean out of sight. Uh, I've been in business meetings where it almost come to blows. And I'm thinking, good night, people. This is church. What are you doing? And people would leave those meetings never to return to church because they were already on the edge. <coughs> Folks, I'm careful. I try to be when I preach because I realize that everybody sitting in this room tonight could be on the edge of something in your life. That one little word or one little deed, something could cause you to go over the edge very easily in your life. And folks, I don't want to be the cause of that. I'm careful about what I do and what I say. Churches today are so fickle. So, so some of them are so far out there uh, that that, that people, not, they're not just on the edge, they're being pushed over the cliff. Uh, I was reading about a pastor in, in Utah just this week. Now you listen to what I'm telling you. <laughs> this pastor last Easter had an Easter play. Listen to what I'm telling you. They put a woman on the cross and had women half naked dancing around the cross. And they asked him, said, why did you do that? Well, we wanted uh, Jesus, we wanted the Lord to see how close we could get to see him. That preacher, I don't know what his name was, but he is lost as an Easter egg and leading thousands of people over the cliff with him. Folks, I'm telling you, things like that happen. We don't hear about it, and we don't see it, so we don't know what goes on. But it goes on, folks, in churches. There's too many preachers in churches that have never been saved. They need to get saved by the grace of God and then begin preaching. They're preaching for a job. Here's what happens. The things that drive us over the edge, watch what I'm telling you. The things that put you over the edge are things that you're pondering in your heart. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing that really puts you over the edge is in your pocket. It's either your phone or your money or some other thing that you're carrying that you're paying more attention to than you are where God is leading you. Uh, people... Uh, they're, they're abomination in God's eyes. There, there's more abominations on that stupid TikTok. Uh, I, I, I'm telling you the truth now. Uh, Y'all look at it. There, there's, uh, I don't look at it. There's so much garbage on that thing. 
uh, on that on the web. I, I'm telling you, uh, and it's in your pocket when you come in the house of God. And if you look at that thing, even sitting in the assembly, you're on the edge of all evil looking at that thing. I'm talking about your cell phone. I know you say, well, preacher, you're on that cell phone again. You're talking about that cell phone. Folks, that's one of the most evil things in people's lives today. People get run over looking at that stupid thing because they won't even watch traffic. That's it. But sitting in a church, in the house of God, you see, that's why Solomon, you see, there was a time in Solomon's life there had to have been, or he wouldn't have made that statement. He was a man of God, been raised by men of God, but there was a time in his life when he was sitting in the assembly of God, but yet when he was sitting there, he realized that he was on the edge of all evil. He knew there was something wrong in his life. Probably them 700 women here. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know. I cannot, I, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, the prodigal son, watch this, the prodigal son was on the edge. He was on the edge of all evil. But even he had enough sense not to say in the house of God, he got up and left and went out and lived righteously. Spent his father's and his inheritance. But God saw where he was down in the pig pen and brought him back. But I, don't you know that when he came back and he was restored by his father, his father welcomed him with open arms and he said, thank God, here's my son who was once dead and now he's alive. Don't you know that there was times he looked back on and he's sitting in that hog pen. Oh, how I wish to the instruction. I would listen to the instruction of my father. How I wish I'd listen and not left the home. They better off than I am. Now I'm down here in despair and I ain't got nothing. I don't know who you are tonight, but I realize where he was because I've been down to the hall pen. I know what it's like down there and it's not good, folks. I was on the edge. Thanks be to God tonight. The Lord saw where I was. And he brought me back up on solid ground. Solomon said, I was almost on the edge of all evil. The Bible tells me that we can be secure in our salvation. Now, you may not believe that tonight. You may think that you can lose it from one day to the next. I don't believe that. I believe the Bible teaches me that once I'm saved, there ain't nobody going to take that away. Now, I ain't going to fall out with you if you don't believe that. That's okay. But I know what I believe. And folks, if our salvation, if we're confident, the Bible says we can be confident in our salvation. I want to ask you tonight. Are you confident about your salvation? Are you confident in who you put your trust in? Have you ever given your heart to Jesus? Because folks, I'm just going to be brutally honest with you. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, you're headed for hell. Right. Say, preacher, I don't like you talking about hell. <laughs> I don't like you talking about it either, but I can't help it. That's what the Bible tells me, folks. You've got two choices. Which way you want to spend eternity. One is heaven. One is hell. The choice is yours. Oh, how I wish I had made that choice when I was them boy's age. The souls that I could have won when I was a teenager. But I refused that instruction. I was on the edge. But I didn't want to get off. I didn't want to serve God. I didn't want to do anything God wanted me to do. And I stayed where I was until I was completely destroyed. And then God picked me up and put me back together. He's still working on me. I don't know what he's doing in your life, 
but he's still trying to put my life back together. Here it is 40 years later, and he ain't done yet. I thank God that with one time, even though I was sitting in the congregation, when I got saved, even after I got saved, folks, I sat in the congregation and be thinking about the preacher's preaching, but I'm thinking about some evil thing that I'm going to do when I get out of church. Yeah. And don't sit there and tell me you ain't done it. <laughs> it's absolutely true, folks. I don't care if you was raised in church like Rhonda was from I seen her when she was in diapers. I don't care how long you've been in church. It happens to everybody. Sin will creep in like that old servant did in the garden. And he'll whisper in your ear, don't listen to that preacher. Don't listen. Don't read that word of God. You don't need all that stuff. That stuff's just a fairy tale. You can live your life the way you want to live. I promise you, folks, if you could spend five minutes in heaven tonight, people would tell you, you better listen to that preacher, you better read the Word of God, and you better put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or you'll spend eternity in that place called hell. So let me ask you tonight. Are you in church? Are you on the edge of all evil? Maybe you're on the edge of just a little evil. It's all the same, folks. You can walk over and you can trip over that edge real easy in your life. But the good news is, you can fall all the way down the cliff, but there's a God in heaven that'll catch you, and he'll restore you, and he'll bring you back to the top and let you serve him. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done. God still loves you just the way you are. Come on, for me. As I read that passage, that really stood out to me. Here Solomon is, the wisest man in the world. And yet he makes a statement. I was on the edge of all evil. Now that's bad enough statement. But then he said, I was in the middle of church. I was in the middle of a congregation and I had this evil thing in my mind. Folks, I think we've all been there. I think we all better repent of that stuff and come to a holy God. Would you stand with me tonight? I have decided to follow Jesus. Are you on the edge tonight? Do you feel like you're slipping over to the other side? Folks, I've decided to stay on the winning side. I'm not going to the other side. I'm going to stay on Jesus' side. He's been so good to me. I can't leave him now. What about you? No. All right, where do you need? Are you doing, where do you need to be with God? Is he working in your life? Oh, trust me. You've never been saved tonight. Listen, you need to come. If God's drawing you, your Holy Spirit's drawing you, you need to come and say, I need Jesus in my life. I can show you in about two minutes how to be saved tonight. If that's you, you need to come. Don't miss this opportunity, folks. We're not promised tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come for somebody. It may never come for me. But I'll tell you this. When I draw my last breath on this side of eternity, my next breath is going to be in the presence of Almighty God. I pray that you know that. I'm confident in my salvation tonight. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. scripture when you get home there and read that whole passage of the instructions on immorality. Folks, we live in a world today that could care less about what we think about immorality. And it's rampant all over our world. Uh, just look around you. It's everywhere. 
We need to be in prayer for those people because, folks, listen, Jesus is going to come back, that trumpet's going to sound, and all those people are going to be left standing here. Say, man, I wish I'd listened to that preacher. I wish that I'd given my life to Christ. But they didn't. Sad day. Sad day. Robert, this is sweet. Father, as we come to you tonight, we come to you with thankful hearts for your word. And Father, we thank you for Brother Mickey that he preaches it in a truthful way. And Father, as me and somebody were talking today, so many times we don't want to hear the truth. But we want it sugarcoated. Father, that's not the way you meant for it to be. Right's right and wrong's wrong. And we can't change that. And Father, we just ask that you help us. That we'll study your word more. And know what you mean for us to do. How you want us to reach out and touch others. Point them in the right direction. Now, Father, we come to you tonight asking you to be with the sick and the afflicted and those that's lost loved ones. Just touch them as only you can. Now, Father, we, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, and what he's done for us throughout our lives. Yes. And, Father, we just ask that go with us this week. Yeah, he can guide and direct us in all we do and say. Yeah. And forgive us 